Thanks very much to Shari and colleagues at the Global Heat Health Information Network for the invitation to make a presentation as part of this masterclass session. As extreme heat becomes more of a risk to Canadians and people in other countries, the masterclass sessions provide an excellent source of information to assist in the development of effective measures to prepare people, communities, and health systems. Health Canada has been supporting the development of heat health action plans, or as we call them in Canada, heat alert and response systems, for over 15 years, and for all of that time has benefited from the research and expertise of Chris. And more recently, we've learned much from the innovative approaches taken by health authorities in India. So it's a great pleasure to be presenting today. An important starting point for Canada is that the country is warming rapidly, and in fact, roughly twice as fast as the global average. The recently released Canada's Changing Climate Report by Environment and Climate Change Canada confirmed that heat events in Canada have been increasing in recent decades and are projected to continue to do so in the future. Canada is a very large country with a diverse climate that has four seasons. Daytime summer temperatures can rise to 35 degrees Celsius and higher, while lows of minus 25 degrees Celsius are not uncommon in the winter. In my presentation, I'll provide examples of actions taken to reduce health risks from extreme heat by public health authorities across the country, from Vancouver in British Columbia, the Assiniboine Health Region in Manitoba, Windsor in Ontario, Montreal and Quebec to Fredericton on the Atlantic coast in New Brunswick. As I mentioned, Canada is warming rapidly and climate projections suggest that this will continue to be the case in the future. Many communities across Canada can expect two or three times the number of hot days they currently experience by 2051 to 2080. And importantly, we also expect to have more warm nights so that many people don't get the chance to cool down and recuperate. A number of population groups have been identified as being at higher risk of heat health illness and death in Canada. And these include older adults, infants and young children, people with chronic illnesses, the physically active, people with low socioeconomic status, and newcomers to Canada and transient uh, populations. And we have evidence that heat can be deadly in Canada. A recent heat wave in the city of Montreal in 2018 resulted in 66 deaths, with 66% of those people being over the age of 65. In addition, 25% of the people that died were living with mental illness. Heat waves dangerous to health occur in many Canadian communities every year. We're also learning that extreme heat can pose serious risks to the health of Canadians through impacts on, on the health systems that are in place to protect them from climate hazards. For example, heat can affect health facilities by impacting medical equipment, the storage of medicines, the thermal comfort of patients and staff, infection control, and even by increasing stress on emergency departments when more patients come in for care. A heat wave in 2007 that included conditions of high humidity shut down the operating theater of the Regina General Hospital in Saskatchewan for eight days. After this event, officials undertook renovations to make the hospital more resilient to future heat waves. Climate change is transforming environmental health decision making due to dynamic and complex, complex disease risks. For example, new or exotic vector-borne diseases, multiple uncertainties, particularly around management of indirect health effects like food insecurity or mental health impacts. The risks of involuntary adaptation, when health sector officials and partners are forced to take adaptation actions to respond to emergencies that may have benefited from greater planning or coordination. And the increased probability of surprises from climate change that can impact health. For example, compounding or cascading events. During the spring and summer of 2017, the province of British Columbia experienced severe flooding due to large snowpack melt, followed by unusually hot summer temperatures, a seasonal water shortage, and then record-breaking wildfire season 
that impacted parts of the health system. So protecting people through heat health action plans will increasingly require consideration of possible surprises such as compounding events from climate change. A number of health departments and agencies in Canada are taking measures to prepare Canadians and health systems for the impacts of climate change, including more heat events. The Climate Change and Innovation Bureau at Health Canada, where I work, has a specific office dedicated to reducing risks from extreme heat. It is also undertaking work to develop the systems and partnerships for better monitoring and surveillance of all climate change impacts on health. In addition, the office is partnering with 10 local or regional health authorities across Canada through our Health Adapt initiative to undertake climate change and health assessments. Many of these projects include heat as a key climate change risk to be addressed. Other federal health partners include Indigenous Services Canada that leads the Climate Change and Health Adaptation Program for First Nations and Inuit communities, the Public Health Agency of Canada that focuses on the impacts of climate change on infectious diseases such as vector-borne diseases, and the Canadian Institutes for Health Research which is supporting research on food as security in the North and Lyme disease. Now, since 2007, Health Canada has had a dedicated program to reducing health risks from extreme heat. The three pillars of this approach have been broad outreach to partners, for example, through a series of webinars on how to cool communities through alterations to the built environment, providing guidance and expertise, such as best practice guidance for developing heat health action plans, which I'll describe shortly, but also guidance on how to conduct community assessments of vulnerability to extreme heat, and guidance on how to communicate heat health risks to the public and to stakeholders. I believe links to these materials have been provided on the GIN website. The third pillar has been federal leadership to help facilitate and coordinate actions among a range of partners. For example, in 2011, Health Canada collaborated with, the, with public health units across Ontario, the Provincial Health Ministry, and the Clean Air Partnership in Ontario to develop a harmonized heat warning system for the province, basically to avoid confusion among the public when warnings were called. So this is the guidance document that Health Canada developed for local and regional health authorities in Canada to help with the development of these plans. The development of the document benefited greatly from guidance provided by the World Health Organization and other partners. It includes detailed information on developing an alert protocol for calling alerts, developing an effective community response plan, such as opening cooling centers, and outreach to vulnerable populations. Developing a communications plan to support all of the activities and developing an approach for evaluating the system to make sure it's effective. As Chris mentioned in her presentation, this is increasingly important as the climate continues to warm. The document also provides information on taking preventative actions, such as modifications to the built environment to reduce the urban heat island effect which can reduce exposures to hot temperatures before heat illness occurs. Health Canada has worked very closely with the Meteorological Service of Canada over many years to develop or to build resilience to heat events in Canada. Health Canada and the MSC worked with public health authorities to develop a more robust heat warning system in Canada, one that was based on evidence of health impact thresholds from heat. The map on the left shows the single national climatological base criteria system that was revised to be more sensitive to specific differences in heat health thresholds at regional levels across the country. And this led to more consistent and coherent communications and the development of a national standard level of services for partners. Heat health action plans need to be tailored to the local context based upon the needs of vulnerable populations, other climate hazards of concern, 
available resources, and such. Since the first plans were developed in Canada in the late 1990s, a number of health authorities have developed many innovative actions to protect their populations from extreme heat based on the local context. For example, many cities distribute heat health brochures. The city of Fredericton included them in their spring water utility bills so that people receive them before the heat season. The updated brochure includes information now on COVID-19 considerations. Montreal Public Health provides advice to the public to help protect children and people with mental illness from the heat. The City of Hamilton has worked with landlords in apartment buildings to provide common cooling spaces for people with air conditioning. And the Assiniboine Regional Health Authority in the province of Manitoba identifies volunteers to transport vulnerable populations to cooling centers and for water distribution. The Heat and Health Office at Health Canada continues to work with a range of partners to facilitate actions to protect health. For example, collaboration with the province of Newfoundland and Labrador to help develop responses and communications around outdoor summer athletic events, events that can attract large numbers of people and increase dangers from extreme heat. The office has also worked with health officials in the province of Nova Scotia to support the development of a provincial extreme heat action plan. This will include a community-based heat alert response system demonstration project, which will provide a framework that could be used in other jurisdictions. Work is also ongoing with partners at Interior Health Re Authority in British Columbia to develop a heat health action plan for rural communities. Rural and isolated communities can face particular challenges to protecting health from extreme heat, such as a lack of cooling centers and challenges in communicating alerts in a timely manner. So it's hoped that this project will benefit other such communities in Canada. Now, health authorities need to work closely with part partners outside of the health sector to be effective in reducing risk from extreme heat. An interesting example of such collaboration is the work that was undertaken in Windsor, Ontario, whereby maps of the urban heat island effect in the city were developed, along with information on heat health vulnerability due to other factors. This information was, was used to develop recommendations about how best to make communities cooler during the hot season and thereby safer. In addition, the thermal comfort of six parks where children play was also assessed in the city and five of the parks were retrofitted to reduce risks from extreme heat. And many of you are aware that the warming climate is also a growing risk to workers, people that work in hot conditions outdoors or indoors. This slide provides information on a heat stress self-assessment tool for workers in Quebec that can be used to understand their health risks from hot temperatures. The tool includes consideration of temperature and humidity, sunshine exposure, clothing, and type of work, and then is divided into, into risk levels from lowest, which is green, to the highest, which is red. And then information is provided based on the assessed risk level, on recommended water intake, and employee and, and employer actions that can be taken to protect health. Given expected future warming in all regions due to climate change, and the fact that other important drivers of heat health vulnerability are constantly changing as well, for example, demographics, socioeconomic conditions, and even uh, health system resiliency, it's very important that heat health action plans are regularly evaluated. The Institut National de Santé Publique in Quebec has developed a guide for evaluating warning systems to protect people from heat and smog. And Health Canada provides advice on undertaking evaluations in its Heat Alert and Response Best Practices Guidance document. Information, including suggested indicators for undertaking process evaluations, so for example, did the system perform well, and outcome evaluations, did the system actually reduce negative health outcomes over time, 
are provided. The table on this slide provides some examples of potential indicators that can be used to undertake these evaluations. In Canada, health authorities in Toronto and Montreal have reported success of these systems leading to an increased awareness of risk to health from heat and the uptake of health protective behaviors such as drinking water, checking for alerts, wearing looser clothing, and seeking cooler locations. This figure is from a study of the Toronto system that demonstrated that in 2010, 70% 70 70 of people responding to a survey reported undertaking eight of the public health recommendations after receiving heat health messaging during an alert. This suggests that the heat health warning system is leading to behavioral changes among many people. Now, there are many challenges that can be faced in the development of heat health action plans. Some examples include data accessibility and limitations. For example, having robust information on heat-related morbidity and mortality or accessibility to meteorological forecasts, but also engaging stakeholders and maintaining their interest in heat health activities over time, and limited understanding of heat health risks among the public, community health officials, and healthcare providers. I think mechanisms like the Global Heat Health Information Network or Health Canada's Heat Health Community of Practice are excellent opportunities to facilitate the sharing of information to help address these challenges. And I should also mention that the increasing number of climate change and health assessments from local to national levels can be an excellent source of information and an excellent uh, broad engagement opportunity to help develop heat health action plans and address some of these challenges. Now, it may be of some interest to, to people that Health Canada is leading the development of the next National Climate Change and Health Assessment, which will be released next year. The assessment will include updated information on heat health risk to Canadians, risk from climate change to health systems, and options for taking adaptation measures to protect uh, to build climate resilience. It is expected that the results will support future development and revision of heat health warning plans in Canada. As I close my presentation, I just want to provide you with information on heat health information products from Health Canada that you may find of some interest. They include staying healthy. Uh, in uh, the heat infographics, brochures for higher risk populations, and an extreme heat awareness video. All of these are available for download from the internet. I also want to leave you with what I think are some important questions to consider as you move forward with actions to pre uh, prepare for the health impacts of climate change, including from extreme heat. How will you regularly integrate information about risks, vulnerabilities, and adaptations into your, act into your activities to make sure that they are effective moving forward? Will you be ready to respond to more climate change and health surprises? And how can you build this capability? These are the kinds of surprises that I mentioned uh, earlier in my presentation. How can you best foster key partnerships that will inc increase your capacity to protect health? For example, with officials from outside of the health sector. And how will you safeguard your health and that of your colleagues as risks increase? For example, stresses to mental health, which may increase. So with that, I would like to thank again colleagues at the Global Heat Health Information Network for the opportunity to make this presentation. And a big thanks to my colleagues Sean Donaldson and Victor Gallant from Health Canada, and Melissa McDonald from the Meteorological Service of Canada for assisting with the development of this presentation. And I've included references in the next couple of slides to a number of the sources that I've mentioned in my presentation for people in case they uh, use. I hope this uh, presentation was helpful. And I really appreciate, again, the opportunity to uh, have provided it.
Thank you very much.